भक्त वृंदा Because of the favor of the Brahmins, the great soul Bali Maharaj, thinking himself very satisfied, became very opulent and prosperous and began to enjoy the kingdom. <coughs> We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 15, entitled, Bali Maharaj Conquers the Heavenly Planets, Text 36. We were discussing yesterday how Bali Maharaj was able to accomplish what he did. The devas had already drunk to their full satisfaction that celestial nectar that was so incredibly precious. It was so precious that two bitter enemies, enemies for countless generations, the Asuras and the Devas, who never get along on any issue, they were actually willing to, be, to work together as allies because there was no other way of getting that nectar. Now, we are little humans crawling around in this earth planet. <clears throat> but when we're speaking about these Asura race, the Dayatas and the Devas, they are extremely powerful, with extremely long lives, and greatly learned. And this is how much they valued this pot of nectar. They were willing to risk their lives, work harder than they ever worked before, <clears throat> hand in hand with their worst enemies, because they considered this so valuable. <clears throat> because it gave such strength, longevity, wisdom, power. <clears throat> and eventually, by the grace of the Lord, despite so many reversals, obstacles, and impersonal, impossible situations, the devas got all of it. And they conquered the asuras. In fact, they killed Bali Maharaj. But Shukracharya, a descendant of the Brigu dynasty, brought Bali back to life. And Bali felt so grateful that he did everything within his power to please the Brahmins, saintly people, the descendants of Brigu. And because he received their blessings, Brahmatejas. He had so much power that even the strength that the nectar provided the demigods could not stand before him. And Bali Maharaj, he was so empowered. Can you imagine? <clears throat> Just by looking at him, Just by seeing Bali, he was so effulgent with potency that Indra and all the devatas disguised themselves and ran away. 
and left all their hard-earned property. Now please understand, to get the property of Indra, it's not like you get a job and you work and you get something. Lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes more of performing yajyas and tapasyas and austerities. <coughs> controlling your senses, living extremely pious, performing a hundred aswameda yajyas, which are impossible for anyone to even do one properly, unless you conquer all directions. <clears throat> that takes many, many lifetimes in order to get that position. And to leave it all behind and run away so that your enemy will just take it and enjoy it all. That was Bali Maharaja's power. Just by seeing him, his enthusiasm. And how did he get it? It's explained here. Because with a very, very good heart, he pleased great souls and received their blessings. So in material society, <clears throat> culture is very much about respect and receiving blessings. <clears throat> In the Indian culture, when I came from the West, coming from the 1960s, where um, there was a war between the two generations. The young generation of those in their teens and 20s were having a cultural revolution against the older generation. And when I come to India and I s entered into the homes of cultured families, I would see every morning that children would touch the feet of their parents and bow down and ask for blessings. Not just as a formality, but they were really asking for blessings. And the parents were giving heartfelt blessings before they went to school, before they went to work, before they went to play. <laughs> There's a certain power and protection in receiving blessings from, from good people. And when those blessings are coming from spiritually evolved people, then it has a very special potency. Because those who are saintly or spiritually evolved, they've taken shelter of the power of God. And the greatest power of God is grace. Grace is sweet. Greatest grace is gentle. But it's more powerful than the wrath of God. The wrath of God can destroy planets or universes or punish people. Even the greatest rulers can be brought down to their knees. But the grace of God could lift one up, even from a very fallen, miserable situation or from a very elevated situation could actually lift one up and give one entrance into the realm of, e of eternity. Apurayamitashvanyam prakritim vidime bhava jiva bhuta mahabhaho Krishna tells in Gita that there are eight material elements earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ahankar or ego and many subdivisions of these. But above and beyond that, 
is another nature, the spiritual nature, which is the atma, the soul, the jiva, that gives power and life. This body is like a vehicle. Just as we see through the windshield of our car, we see through our eyes. Just as we make noise through the horn, we make noise through our tongue. We hear through our ears, feel through our skin, think through our brain, smell through our nose. But who is it that's experiencing? The body is a just matter. Matter is not conscious, but it is that spiritual nature, that spiritual force. Prabhupada calls it the living force, which is the atma or the soul, which animates and experiences through this body. And how to realize in our present condition, since time immemorial, due to the ego, the ahankar, the soul is in a dream state thinking that I am this mind and I am this body and we're forgetful of our own eternal nature. And we think when the body's dead, I'm dead. <clears throat> and when the body's in pain, I'm in pain. And we forget the love, the love for God that is within us and the, the unlimited ecstasy of that love we're trying to find it somewhere, because it's our, it's our nature. It's our most fundamental need to find unlimited love, and to love unlimitedly. And we're searching for it, we're groping for it, and whatever we could find that gives us some pleasure, that gives a semblance to that, we attach ourselves to those things. And different people, Look for it in different ways. The power of grace can destroy illusion, can destroy ignorance, and awaken the true glory of the self. Reveal the inner ecstasy and reveal our relationship with God, and reveal our relationship, our true relationship with all beings. Where there is love for God, there is natural, spontaneous compassion for every living being. It cannot be otherwise. Otherwise, that love is not awakened. So this is the power of God's grace. It can liberate us forever and bring us to the highest platform of eternal love and eternal fulfillment. So the saintly persons who are connected to that grace of God, having taken shelter of the Supreme Lord, That's what they have to give to the world. That's what they want to give to the world. But we have to be willing to accept it and to access it. Just like the sun wants to give sunlight to everyone without discrimination of who's fit or unfit. If we hide in a cave, we will not get any of the benefits of the sunlight. We'll have a vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> we won't see anything either. But if we just go out into the sunlight, we get so many of the benefits of the sunlight. In the same way, through saintly people, God is 
giving the light of his grace. And that is, and that is their blessing. The blessing of great souls is giving Krishna's blessings. And that blessing is beyond the giver. To be an instrument of the unlimited is the most fantastic way of living. There's not all that much fun in doing the best you can according to what you can do. But to do the best you can and access a grace, a power that is far beyond yourself and seeing that manifesting through you, that has to humble you. You see, when you do something great yourself, you can easily become proud. But when you recognize that it's not me, there's something beyond me happening here, if you actually recognize that, you cannot become proud or arrogant. You become humble. Why me? This is the way the great saints think. Why, why is this happening through me? And therefore, such personalities, they're always seeking blessings. They're giving blessings without even giving. All they have to do is be pleased with you and you get all the blessings. Because you cannot demand blessings. When, when we actually give satisfaction to a great spiritual personality, then, then through that satisfaction, Krishna or God showers unlimited blessings on you. And if you cause dissatisfaction to, a, to great personalities, then just the opposite happens. And God's not very satisfied. He withdraws his mercy. Krishna tells in one, to, in one beautiful verse, mad bhakta puja vyadika, that one who serves my devotee is more dear to me than one who serves me. Like a, like a father or a mother. If you do something to please the child, then the parents are much more happy than if you do something for them because they love the child so much. Or in the West there is the saying, love me, love my dog. Yes. You know, because, in, because people become very much attached to their dogs. They put so much affection in their dog. If you give if you give them a nice flower and then kick the dog in the face, they'll probably throw the flower in your face. If you give a diamond ring to a mother and then punch her child, is she going to be happy with you? Baby child? No, if you give the diamond ring to the child, she'll probably be happier. because there's love. So, in this particular verse, Bali Maharaj, he gained such material prosperity simply because he was very eager and anxious to receive blessings. And we find, in the future chapters, he's going to get the highest spiritual reward also. Because he had that temperament 
of being very grateful. In order to receive blessings, first of all, blessings comes through the will and the instructions of the great souls. The, spirit, the guru, the saints, they are giving instructions on in how to live a pious life of good character and devotion to the Lord. And if we accept those instructions and live by them, then we receive the blessings. It's not some supernatural thing where somebody has to come up and touch your head to give you blessings. That touching head stuff is a very cheap blessing. The real blessing is in their words. And when we actually apply their words to our life and live by that type of pure, humble, and sincerely devotional character, then we are accepting the blessings. And with that blessings comes that unlimited grace by which one can overcome all obstacles. Whether you are a criminal or a saint, physically you have to die. But death is not an impediment for a person who has been illuminated by those blessings. Why? Because for such a person, consciously we realize that death is a change of clothes, that the soul lives on. And ultimately, our relationships, when we have cultivated spiritual relationship, those relationships live on. When we love a person's eternal soul, of course you can't love a person's eternal soul unless you recognize their soul, and you can't recognize their soul unless you recognize your own soul. But when we're self-realized, then our relationships take on a completely different dimension. They're not limited just to the proximity of these bodies which are going to vanish at any time and in due course of time. When you're young, sometimes you hear it, but it just doesn't really make any difference because we have so much energy and we think we have so long to live. But little Prahlad was five years old and he was teaching the same idea Bhagavad Dharma to his five-year-old classmates. And they were revealing their minds to Prahlad. Why are you telling us we're only five years old? All this stuff about God and self-realization, this is for old people who are about to die. Because they don't really have that much else to look forward to. So, But we have whole lives ahead of us. Prahlad said, Komara achade pragyo dharman bhagavataniha. It's actually for five-year-old children. <laughs> it's for everyone. Because you don't know if you'll live one more day. There's no guarantee for anyone. We see it, but we don't believe it. A few years ago, right here in the temple, I remember it was about four o'clock in the morning and everything started shaking. And the windows were going and the doors were going and the gym. At that time, our, we had our orphanage downstairs and they were all screaming, but they were screaming Krishna's name, so it was quite sweet. But they were really screaming Krishna's names. Do you remember Govinda? It wasn't like, Krishna, Krishna, they were screaming Krishna's names because there was an earthquake and the whole building was trembling, shaking and, and it was, felt like it was on the verge of just collapsing right on our heads. So the brahmacharis, children, everybody was chanting. 
Krishna was just playing his flute. <laughs> no problem for him. And it stopped, but just a couple hundred miles away from here, there were 12,000 people killed within a few minutes. And the vast majority of them were young people, housewives, they, you know, the mothers, you know, they put their idli mix together for, so in the morning they could easily make breakfast. They never were thinking that, they, that that idli mix would never be used. The children had their you know, plans for the next day of school or play. No one had any conception that they would never wake up. But there were about 15,000 people who never woke up. And a couple years later, the same thing happened in Gujarat a few hundred miles away. A couple years after that, there was that tsunami. And every day, people fall off trains or get car crashes. So, you know, we don't want to just dwell on these negative things, but we should, they should sober us. Because unless we understand the imminence of death, we never really take advantage of the beauty of life how precious every moment is and what real life is about. Accessing that eternal nature which is beyond birth and beyond death. Which every great spiritual tradition throughout history has been focusing on that. On the consciousness beyond matter that's the animating force, the real you, the real me. So oh, instructions in how to live in harmony with our true self, that is God's blessing to the world. If a person's sick and you cure them of a disease, even by some miracle, that's not as much a blessing as awakening a person's divine consciousness because they're going to get sick again and they're going to die so it's just a temporary measure when they asked our Gurudev Prabhupada can you show me a miracle can you make ashes can you make gold can you make jewelry can you can you cure sick people Prabhupada was very humble. He said, I have gone to the West and made hippies into happies. <laughs> In other words, just people who were lost gave them direct connection to their eternal blissful nature and to God, to Krishna raise them above death. That is actually the birthright of every human being. Atato Brahma Jigyasa. That's the greatest purpose of human life. It's the greatest opportunity within human life. And Accessing blessings is such an important part of this. Even when the Supreme Lord descends, he teaches by his own example. We read about the greatest saints and the greatest avatars. Jiva Goswami, greatest scholar that ever lived. But yet, he, cons he considered himself to be just a humble instrument of his guru, Rupa Goswami's blessing. And 
There's that beautiful story when, when one proud scholar came to, def to defeat Rupa and Sanatana Goswami in debate and get their signature on a certificate that they were formally um, defeated by him. And Rupa and Sanatana Goswami said, there's no, you t there's no need to debate with us because you're better than us anyway, so just give us the certificate and we'll sign it. They signed it. They didn't care what people thought. And then he was going around showing everybody. And Jiva Goswami said, they could have defeated you. They're just, they're just not arrogant like you. <laughs> that they want to be famous for being great scholars. They're using their scholarship to understand the truth, not to make themselves prestigious. To defend their name, I will debate you. And he was their nephew and their student. And he debated and he defeated them. He defeated the scholar. And the scholar had to rip up all his signatures and <laughs> leave. So Rupa Goswami chastised Jiva Goswami. Why you did that? He said, I was trying to defend your name, Guruji. He said, no. He said, you fell into the trap of using your scholarship for your own prestige. Now you have defeated him. And to live in Vrindavan, no one with even a trace of this type of arrogance should live in Vrindavan, so you should leave. Now he could have just defended himself, but he accepted. Maybe I don't understand what my guru is saying, but it must be good for me. He must be right. Maybe I just don't... He must be seeing on a deeper level that, that it was due to pride that I did that. And he left. And he started performing tapasya. And eventually Rupa Goswami brought him back when he heard about Sanatan Goswami and Rupa Goswami brought him back. And Rupa Goswami was so proud of him. He revealed to him the innermost confidential secrets of spiritual truths. Because he saw that his disciple was just so sincere. He had no ulterior motives. And Lord Ram, we read in Ramayan, Ram is the Supreme Lord incarnate in this world. Supreme Lord means Bhagavan, the possessor of all beauty, all knowledge, all strength, all wealth all fame, and all detachment. That, according to the Vedas, is the definition of God, Bhagavan, the source of everything that exists. Krishna tells in Gita, all beautiful, wonderful things within this world are just a spark of my splendor, like a ray of the sun. So, when Ram was living in Ayodhya, the great saint, Vishwamitra, he came to the courtyard, I mean to the court, and the king, now Dasarat, was not just like a political leader of today, he was actually a king. And in those days, long ago, there wasn't elections every four years <laughs> where you had to campaign and you had to make allies with enemy parties just to somehow or other get enough seats so that you can be in your situation and then you have to compromise with all different types of lobbyists otherwise they'll withdraw their support and their funding. Yes, today, in those days a king was a king until he decided to give the kingdom to his son, or a queen, whatever. A very powerful person, massive armies, tremendous wealth, and it was for life. Now, usually people who have that type of power, practically absolute power, when you're a king of a massive kingdom, 
And all the citizens loved him because he ruled with such compassion and he had no ulterior motives. He was really there for them. Because in the Vedic system, everyone is a servant. No one is a master. Only God is master. And even God likes to serve. So everyone's a servant. King means you give your life to serve the subjects you have in your kingdom. And the subjects are serving each other and serving the king. Everyone's serving. The guru is serving the disciples. The disciples are serving the guru. Jivera Swadopoi Krishnara Nityadas. But everyone's in the spirit of service. That's spiritual consciousness. So here is Dasarat Maharaj. He's more than a billionaire. He's the proprietor of everything in his kingdom. And he's sitting on his magnificent throne. And in comes Vishwamitra. Vishwamitra is just wearing tree bark. <laughs> he has no house. He has no home. He lives in the, f in the jungle, sleeping on the ground. No possessions. His only set of clothes is some tree bark around his body. And he comes in. But because he's a saintly person, he has attained the wealth and the power of self-realization. And Dasarat Maharaj understood that as a king, he had attained the wealth and the power of the things of this world. But it didn't compare to what Vishramicha had. So from his heart, he came down off his throne and put Vishramicha on his throne and washed his feet. Such a humble position. You know, washing feet is not like if you go to the hospital and you have a cut on your foot and the doctor will wash your feet. <laughs> but it's not like that. This is out of, he's not getting paid for it. <laughs> That's the main thing. He's not doing it to treat Vishwamitra Muni. He's doing it to actually, from his heart. You are great, I am small. And then he asks for Vishwamitra Muni's blessings. He said, whatever I have is only due to the blessings of saintly people. So please give me instructions and give me blessings. Now the thing about this blessing stuff is you have to be prepared. <laughs> if, you, if you just ask, expecting to get what you want, it may not be like that. So Vishwamitra Muni said, oh yes, here is my blessing. Give me your son, Ram. <laughs> then death, he loved his son. And for Dasarat Ram, he may have been the Supreme Lord, but for, for Dasarat Maharaj, being the Supreme Lord was a detail. The real thing is he's my son. <laughs> As a boy who, who was depending on him, who was still very young, he was only a teenager. And you want, to take, you want to take him into the forest to fight against Rakshashas? Very, very powerful, mystical um, demons? Vishwamitra Muni say, yes, I want to bring him to the forest. These, these Rakshashas, these supernatural, these demons with supernatural powers, they are harassing the saints, so we, I want your son to come. And Dasarat said, I will come with my whole army, but leave Ram home. Vishwamitra said, I want Ram, I don't want you, and I don't want your armies. 
And Dasara tried to talk him out of his blessing. <laughs> First he asked for a blessing, then he was doing everything within his mental power to, to talk him out of it. But Vishwamitra Muni was very focused. <laughs> so eventually, Dasarat was thinking, and, Vif and some other sages said, Dasarat, you don't want to displease this great personality. Give him Ram. And, you know, he will protect Ram, don't worry. So they left. So Ram, the Supreme Lord, takes the blessings of his father before he goes. And then he takes the blessings of Vishwamitra Muni to go. And then he takes the blessings of his mother to go. And he goes. And then there's so many stories that happen there. When they actually did happen, that fight took place. Ram received the blessings of Vishwamitra first. And although Ram is the Supreme Lord, he wanted to teach. They came to one forest place where they, for the first time, they saw the river Ganges, the Ganga. And Ram was so enthusiastic. He asked Vishwamitra, please tell me about the history. Tell me about the, the greatness of the river Ganga. And Vishwamitra Muni, for a long time, he extolled the history and the, the power and the glories of the sacred river Ganges. And Ram was massaging his guru's feet and doing little services, bringing him wood to start fires to keep warm at night in the forest. And then Vishwamitra Muni led them toward Mithila. Mithila, the kingdom of Janak. And Vishwamitra Muni told Ram and his brother Lakshman that here in this beautiful kingdom there is an ancient bow and anyone who could lift and string this bow will get Sita, the princess's hand, in marriage. Ram and Lakshman listened. When they came into the kingdom, Janak Maharaj heard Vishwamitra Muni's come. So he first sent ministers there to greet him. Then Janak himself, that king of that kingdom of Mithila, brought Janak into, I mean, Vishwamitra into his court, put the sage on a throne, washed his feet, honored him, said, how can I serve you? Please give me your blessings. 